Take your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 15, and we'll continue our study in the book of Mark. Today we'll look at the first part of this chapter. Next week we'll look at the second part of this chapter. The following week, Ken Lynch will be with us preaching on Sunday morning, and then the week after that will be Resurrection Sunday. I know some call it Easter Sunday. I strongly prefer Resurrection Sunday. We're about celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we'll pick it up in Mark chapter 16. You say, how did you do that? Very carefully, planning the sermons. So we get to Mark chapter 16 on Resurrection Sunday. Then after that, I'll be preaching out of the Old Testament for a few uh, weeks, and then plan to do a series um, on, on marriage and family and parenting. That will be both Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. So if you're the type of person that really enjoys Sunday morning and, you know, the other one's not so important, I want you to make the other ones important too. Yeah. And if you can't join us in person, we do live stream our uh, messages, the times of worship, uh, and also they're available later as, as, as a record, uh, digital copy, on sermon audio, or even on our church's YouTube channel if, if that's where you can find us. Mark chapter 15, I'm going to read the first 20 verses of the chapter. That's what we're going to deal with today. Think about Jesus for Barabbas as I read Mark chapter 15, verses 1 through 20. And straightway in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answering said unto him, Thou sayest it. And the chief priests accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold how many things they witness against thee. But Jesus yet answered nothing. So that Pilate marveled. Now at that feast he released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired. And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder. In the insurrection. And the multitude, crying aloud, began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priest had delivered him for envy. But the chief priest moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said unto them, What will ye then? that I shall do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews. And they cried out again, Crucify him! Then Pilate said unto them, Why? What evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him! And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them, and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole band, and they clothed him with purple, and plaited a crown of thorns, and put it upon his head, and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they smote him on the head with a reed, and did spit upon him, and bowing their knees worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him, and put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. Father, this is a difficult passage to read, that injustice, the unfairness of it all, that your perfect son, the perfect lamb of God, the one in whom was no guile, never a sin, never did anything wrong, never broke a single commandment, should be condemned to die and take the place of a man who was a sinner and a murderer and a, a, a rebel. Father, calm our hearts and our spirits and guide our thinking so we understand the message that is here. And then, Father, make application in my heart. Make application to my listeners' hearts. And I pray particularly if there is someone this morning that is here that is not a Christian, they're not your child, they don't know that their sins are forgiven, they're wondering about what awaits them in the next life, that you would take this message from your word 
and cause it to directly enter their hearts, just like an arrow hitting the target. May your Holy Spirit bring conviction. May your Holy Spirit bring encouragement. And we trust you to do the work this morning. We thank you for meeting with us as we worshiped you. We thank you that you promise us where two or three are gathered together in your name, there you are in the midst of them. Thank you, Father. We pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us. <laughs> Amen. Now, I'm going to step away from the, the weight of this passage for a minute. It, it is a weighty passage. I always have trouble reading the accounts of the crucifixion, the trial, the torture, the beating, the mockery, and the crucifixion in the Gospels. So let me, let me take a step away and talk about something a little bit lighter for a minute. Baseball season is already almost here. Almost here. I think they're going to start this week, I think, some of their first games. Uh, and so let me tell you the story of Steve Palermo. Uh, Steve Palermo was uh, an American League umpire. This is a picture of him making a call there at the plate. He uh, was born in 1949, so some of you say, well, I was born about that time. He was he began umpiring by the time he was 28 years old. He was umpiring in the American League. He's a great umpire. At one point, the Sporting News ranked him as the number one umpire in the American League. He uh, was part of the, the team that umpired the 1983 World Series. He was part of the team that umpired the 1986 uh, All-Star Game. Multiple times, he was part of the crew that umpired the American League Championship Series. Just a great umpire. In 1991, he had been umpiring now for about 14 years. He had just finished uh, being an umpire at a Texas Rangers game in Texas. And he went out to eat with some friends. And while he was sitting there at the meal, uh, eating and enjoying his time with friends, somehow, it, it wasn't clear to me, but he got a report, he and his friends got a report, that there were some muggers out in the parking lot who were assaulting some waitresses who had just gotten off their shift. So Steve Palermo and his friends... They didn't just call 911. They said, you call 911. They went out there to confront the mothers. And while they were out there trying to protect these waitresses from whatever evil designs these criminals had on them, the criminals pulled out a gun and shot Steve, and the bullet went through his spinal cord, and he was paralyzed from the waist down. And he never umpired another baseball game. As I thought about that story this week, I'm not even sure how I came across it, but I, I thought about that story. I thought, you know, that is, seems to me, as a human being, that seems very unjust. Here's a man who's good at what he does. He enjoys umpiring. People admit he's a good umpire. I mean, how many people do you know admit that the umpire is doing a good job? <laughs> and here, trying to be a good citizen, trying to prevent a crime, trying to protect some ladies, he's shot and paralyzed so that he can never, never umpire another game. That sounds to me to be unjust. And I don't know about you, but I really despise injustice. It always has bothered me when the bully swaggers around the playground beating kids up because he doesn't know what else to do. It bothers me when, when, when uh, adults who should know better use their money or their their fame, or just their brute strength to take advantage of other people. That just seems so unjust. I know with my own children, boy, you have a situation and one child says, well, this is what happened, and the other child says, no, this is what happened, and they don't match up. Sometimes you want to say, you're both in trouble. <laughs> no, no, that don't do that. <laughs> because sometimes one of them is not guilty and as a parent trying to figure out which one is right and which one is wrong so that I can be just as a father that's very hard Mark 14 and 15 therefore very hard for me to read because here's Jesus the perfect one never did anything wrong but his enemies hate him so much they send soldiers to capture him. it isn't in Mark but in the book of Luke Jesus says to his disciples to encourage them, he says, don't you know I could call legions of angels? But Jesus, defenseless because he chose to be defenseless, allowed these brutes to take him and to falsely accuse him. We're going to see that again. In fact, let's take a look at the passage here. Um, they 
accused Jesus of perverting the nation, of forbidding Jews to pay taxes, and of claiming to be king. These charges are from John chapter 18. Now, if you think about it, that's ridiculous. Num number one, you remember the story, we read it earlier, Mark chapter 12, where they bring a, a question to Jesus and they say to him, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? And Jesus says, show me a coin. And they show him a coin, and guess whose image is on that coin? Caesar's. He says, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. So why would you accuse a man who's just said that, earlier in the week, literally, of um, forbidding Jews to pay taxes? I mean, they were lying. They were lying about him. And I don't know about you, but when people lie to get someone else in trouble, that bothers me. Amen. They accuse him of claiming to be king. Pilate in investigates this charge and says, are you king? He says, that's what you say. And later in John, it, Jesus answers Pilate by saying, if my kingdom were of this world, then would my followers fight. And yet they accused Jesus of claiming to be king. They accused Jesus of perverting the nation. What did Jesus ever do to turn people in the wrong direction? So it bothers me reading about an unjust trial. It bothers me because Pilate, rather than standing up for truth and saying, hey, this man is innocent, he goes ahead and gives him to the soldiers and lets the soldiers torture him, whip him, put a crown of thorns on his head, beat him with a stick. And then, then Pilate says, here he is. I just, it just, it's hard. To think about the injustice that sent Jesus. Perhaps the ultimate injustice, of course, is that then he, Pilate, turns Jesus over uh, to be crucified. Uh, let me, I, I, I gave you a, a, a summary here. Let, let me back up here and let's go through these one by one. Let's first of all talk about the injustice of Jesus' trial. You know already from last week that Jesus is betrayed by Judas. Who comes to the chief priests, the religious leaders. By the way, shouldn't religious leaders be scrupulously just? You'd think so. But he comes to the religious leaders, he says, listen, I tell you what, if you'll pay me, I will make a convenient time, I'll find a convenient time to betray Jesus into your hands. So they give him 30 pieces of silver. And on this night, while Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, Judas gathers his group of soldiers given to him by, by the chief priests, and he goes and they arrest Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but if you can imagine someone being arrested at night, don't you think they'd be held overnight at least, and then maybe the next day or the next week be arraigned? But no, not at all. They immediately take Jesus to the high priest's house, and they hold a trial in the middle of the night. Now, if you really believe someone is guilty, do you hold the trial in the middle of the night? No. No, you want other people to understand, here he's guilty, here's our evidence. They, they know he's not guilty. They're not trying to do this right. They hold this trial in the middle of the night. Then they bring him to Pilate, and again, they accuse him falsely. And I don't have time to bring this out, but if we were to look at the books of Mark and John, there are five times in those two books that Pilate says to either the religious leaders or to the people, I can't find there's any guilt in this guy. Why are you bringing him to me, he says to the religious leaders. Later he says here in, in our passage, what do you want me to do with Jesus? Why? Because Pilate knows that Jesus is innocent. So you would think, if you're a governor, you want to be just that this pilot would stand up and say, listen, guys, you can't, you can't touch this guy. He's not guilty. But it says in our text, willing to content the people. Verse 15, just to make the people happy. Not because Pilate believed Jesus was guilty. Not because Pilate believed Jesus was a threat. Not because Pilate was doing his job as a Roman governor. No, just to keep the people happy. The injustice of Jesus' trial bothers me. The injustice of his torture bothers me. 
the very night that he's in the high priest's house, after they declare him to be guilty, Mark 14, 63 tells us the high priest said, What need we have, what need we any further witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy, and they all condemned him to die. And then verse 65 says, Some began to spit on him, and to cover his face, and to buffet him, to punch him. They put something over his head, they covered his face so he couldn't see, and then they struck him. Another gospel tells us that then they made fun, and they'd say, okay, now tell us, prophesy, who hit you? Well, that isn't a way, the way you treat someone, even if they are guilty. You wouldn't treat them that way. Then after that, he stands before Pilate. Pilate turns Jesus over to the Romans. The Roman soldiers and they scourge him and they take that crown of thorns and they put it on his head and they take a reed and they 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 hit him Jesus had done nothing wrong this does fulfill prophecy however Isaiah chapter 52 says as many were stonied at thee his vision his face in other words was so marred more than any man. Centuries before this, Isaiah prophesied that he'd be beaten in such a way you wouldn't be able to recognize who he was. The injustice of his torture. The injustice of his crucifixion, we'll look more at this next week, but he's taken to Golgotha, Calvary, the place of the skull. He's nailed to a cross in a public place, and it's intended... Crucifixion is always intended to be a humiliating experience. And let's not forget, we read about it, that Jesus was sinless. This wasn't even a miscarriage of justice in that maybe he'd done something small and they made a big deal out of it. He had done nothing wrong and they crucified him. And what was Jesus' response? Hold your place in Mark 15. And turn to Luke chapter 23 with me. What was Jesus' response to all this injustice? Luke chapter 23 and verse 34. Here is Jesus' response to injustice. Luke 23, 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Do you think after all of that injustice, you could say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We read the passage in 1 Peter chapter 2. It says, Who, Jesus, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Jesus committed his case, his situation, his injustice to God. Which brings me to my first application, and I'll bring this out again at the end. But if you're a Christian this morning, God wants us to forgive others just as God has forgiven us. Right. And yes, there are going to be injustices in life. People will intentionally mistreat you. People will lie about you. People will make up stories about you to make you look bad. They may even uh, somehow hinder a promotion at work or hinder your ability to, to accomplish something. And you know what? Jesus knows what that feels like to be treated unjustly. Mm -hmm. And he was able to forgive. Now God calls us to forgive those who have treated us unjustly. There's a second part of this these events that I want you to notice, though, and that's that Jesus took Barabbas' place at mm -hmm. Calvary. Go back to verse 7, uh, Mark chapter 15 and verse 7. This is a very apt picture of what Jesus has done for each one of us. That is, Jesus took our place at Calvary. But look what it, what it says here in, in 
Mark 15, verse 7, and there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him, who had committed murder in the insurrection. Now, Barabbas' name means son of a father. You remember we looked at Bartimaeus earlier in the book of Mark, and we noted that his name simply means son of Timaeus. It's almost as if he did not have a name, right? Well, this man's even worse. He is not the son of somebody. He's just the son of a father. By the way, all of you who are sons are sons of a father, right? You can't be the son of not a father. I don't know if he changed his name in an effort to avoid prosecution or if he had lost his name or just was so unimportant that they just nicknamed him son of a father. But Barabbas gives us the idea he's not, he's not anyone of significance, not even enough to have a name. But at some point, he had led an insurrection. He had led a revolt against the Romans. He had said, I'm going to get rid of these evil, nasty fellas. And so he had led a revolt. And in the revolt, in his effort to overthrow the Roman government, he had killed some people. He was a murderer. Does a murderer deserve to die? And the answer is yes. Yes, God is a God of justice, and he gives Man, humans, instruction in his word that if a man takes another man's life, the punishment, the just punishment for that is execution. So Barabbas deserves to die. On the other hand, Jesus, he had done nothing wrong. Done nothing wrong. And Pilate knew this. I mentioned that earlier. Pilate was not under the impression that Jesus had done anything wrong. He wasn't trying to carry out a just sentence. But he knew that there was this custom he had at this time of the year, this uh, uh, um, Passover time of the year, he would release a prisoner just, just to keep the Jews happy, just to make sure that they understood he's a nice guy. And he thought, here's my perfect opportunity. Jesus is innocent anyway. I'll just let Jesus go. Then I, I'll, my conscience will be clear because he's not guilty anyway. The people will be happy. I release a prisoner to them, and, and it'll all work out. But the chief priests had anticipated this. Here these fellows, these chief priests, were supposed to be honest, just men. And they had anticipated that Pilate might try to do this. And so they had gone and they had stirred up the crowd and they said, Listen, if Pilate suggests releasing Jesus, say, No, no, we don't want Jesus. We want Barabbas. Now think about that for a second. You're a Jew living at this time. And you've heard about Jesus' miracles. You've heard about how he's healed the lame. He's made blind people to see. He's even raised people from the dead. At two different points, he's taken just a little bit of food and broken it up so that literally thousands of people were fed. Don't you think you would want that man released? Or would you like a murderer released? Someone who's willing to kill for his political ends and goals. Well, you know the story. People say, we want Barabbas. We don't want Jesus. We want Barabbas. And Pilate follows up with, well, then what am I going to do with Jesus? And they cry out, crucify him. <clears throat> wow. I, I can't, even, can't even imagine. Now we know that the, the chief priests had given Jesus to, over to Pilate, had, were, were trying to arranged for his execution, for his crucifixion, because they envy Jesus. And let me warn you, this isn't the point of this message, but let me warn you, envy is an incredibly destructive attitude. It'll lead you to do things that you will regret later. Now, I have to admit, there's been times I've seen someone else achieve success, someone else be blessed by God, and I said, well, hey, what about me? Why can't I be like that? Listen, the better attitude is praise the Lord that God's blessed them. Praise the Lord that they've achieved that success. Because envy will destroy us. But envy, destructive attitude, leads us to destroy others in an effort to promote ourselves. And so the chief priest had, demand, had, had, had instructed the people to demand Barabbas' release and demand the crucifixion of Jesus. Barabbas, no name, son of a father, Jesus who was truly the son of God. Barabbas, he had killed people. He was a murderer. 
Jesus had raised people from the dead. Uh, Barabbas tried to overthrow the Roman rule. Jesus had never tried to overthrow Roman rule. Barabbas, sinner, just like you and me. Jesus, perfectly sinless. Barabbas. Was Barabbas ready to die? No. Jesus. Was Jesus ready to die? Yes. That's why he allowed the crowd to take him the night before. You remember there were other times when they had tried to kill Jesus. Once in Nazareth, they were going to throw him off a cliff. Yep. Another time in Jerusalem, they picked up stones to stone him. And both times he just walks through the crowd and he walks away because it was not his time to die. But here, Jesus is ready to die. And I want to emphasize that Jesus wasn't trapped. He wasn't tricked. He chose to die in our place. Right. Just like he chose to die in Barabbas' place. He could have walked free. He could have said something. I wonder, I don't know, the Bible doesn't say this part, but I wonder that Jesus did not say more in his trial. Because every other time through the Gospels, when Jesus needs to say something, he always says the exact right thing, doesn't he? But here at his trial, if he says too much, they'll have to release him. And yes, I know it was prophecy that as a lamb, before its shear is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. We are much like Barabbas. I don't mean that we're guilty of murder in the sense that Barabbas was, but I do mean that we are all sinners, and we all deserve just punishment. We're all in bondage to sin. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. We're already captive to sin. We're already in bondage. We can't help ourselves. And just as Jesus took Barabbas' place, Jesus stands ready and willing to take your judgment as well. 1 Peter chapter 3 says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. The just, Jesus, suffered for the unjust, that's us, sinners, so that he could bring us to God. And in this historic event, Jesus goes to the cross and Barabbas goes free. Now this too is a grave injustice. It bothers me to think that a guy who's a murderer and a rebel and, and an evil man, he gets to walk free and Jesus, the perfect one, the sinless one, dies in his place. But again, it's an apt picture because the Bible says that there is none righteous, no, not one. That includes me. That includes you. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. We deserve that punishment for our sins. But that same verse that says the wages of sin is death says that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible teaches us that Jesus voluntarily willingly took our sins upon himself. We read it earlier this morning, 1 Peter 2, 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Now imagine with me a courtroom, and there's a judge and he's a good judge. He, he really wants to do what is right. And a man comes accused of a crime. It's a pretty serious crime. He's, he needs to serve some time for his criminal act. It would be wrong for that judge to just say, don't worry about it. I, I, I know you're sorry. You can go free. We would say that was unjust. For a judge to not uh, sentence a man who's been deemed guilty. But now let's imagine, here's this guilty man. He's been declared guilty by the jury. He's being ready to be sentenced by the judge. And instead of the judge giving that man his sentence, the judge gives that same sentence 
In this man's place, he gives that same sentence to his son. That's what Jesus did for us. You know the verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus died in our place. He took the penalty that we deserved. Let me show you one other verse. Hold your place there in Mark chapter 15 and turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. You know Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But let's read on. Romans 3.24 says, Being justified by the word, by the word, by the way, that word justified simply means that God declares one to be righteous. Somebody's explained it this way. To be justified is to be just as if I never sinned. And that's true. Be, not because I'm a good person, not because I do something to earn it, but because God declares me to be righteous. Verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation, a sacrifice in our place through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Now verse 26, to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. In sending his son to die on the cross, God accomplishes two things. Number one, he accomplishes his purpose of justice and judgment. A.J. talked this morning in his Sunday school class about the justice of God. God cannot let sin go. He can't just say, well, I know you've done a lot of bad things, but it's okay. That's not just. But God also loves us. He loves us so much that he was willing to substitute his son in our place. So that, yes, he can declare us to be righteous. He can say, you are righteous because he's taken all of that sin off of us and he put it on Jesus Christ at the cross. God must punish sin. And indeed, he has punished sin. When Jesus Christ took my sins, took your sins, on his body, on the cross, God the Father punished sin, and he is just. And now he desires to be the justifier of those who believe in Jesus, the one who declares a sinner to be righteous. Let me make two applications here to close this up. Number one, expect injustice in this world. Expect it. This side of glory, there is no justice, human justice. Not complete human justice. We can get it pretty right. We can be pretty close. We can be right some of the time, but there are times we're going to miss it. Even as a father, even as a parent, I, I mentioned earlier, two kids, and they both have their own version of events, and I am sure, I am sure that from time to time I got it wrong, and I did an injustice. And maybe I've done some injustice to you. I, I don't intentionally do it, but there are times when I've said something or I've responded to you a certain way and, well, you took offense, Pastor. Why? I am sorry. But there is no perfect justice on this side of glory. Now, I assure you that there is a just God. He sits in heaven. And one day he will, just, he will righteously judge the wicked men and the wicked women who are destroying this world. But this side of glory, you may not get justice. God doesn't want you to sit and soak in bitterness. Not forgiving that person who did that injustice. Holding on to it, thinking, boy, someday I'm going to get revenge. That's not God's intention for any of us. But there's a second application I want to make, and that is... The greatest injustice in the world's history is that Jesus, the perfect one, died in the place of sinners. That's, that is the greatest injustice. That's what makes reading these passages so hard because Jesus didn't deserve to die. If anyone, if anyone deserved to live, it was Jesus. 
And yet he willingly, voluntarily, went in our place and took our sins upon himself. That's the greatest injustice. But there's a second injustice that's almost as great as that, and that's when a sinner sees clearly that Jesus Christ died in their place and says, that's okay, I'm good. That's not okay. You're not good. That's why Jesus had to die, because we're not good. Because we know that all have sinned. There's none righteous, no, not one. Oh yeah, we may have kept a lot of the laws a lot of the time, but none of us has kept all of God's laws all of the time. Sin is any time that I think something that breaks God's law, or say something that breaks God's law, or do something that breaks God's law. That's what sin is, and all of us are sinners. So for us to recognize, to see, oh boy, there's Jesus. He died in my place, but that's okay. I'm good. That is a great, great injustice. Don't forget that one day Jesus Christ, who is alive, he's risen. We're going to celebrate that in a couple weeks. He is alive. He's risen. He is going to come back and judge those who are alive and those who have died. And if today you are a sinner, we all are sinners, but you say, you know, I don't need Jesus. I'm good. I'm close. I'm good enough. Then someday you'll stand before Jesus, and instead of being your Savior, he will be your judge. 2 Timothy 4.1 says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. It's the Lord Jesus Christ who will one day sit in judgment of all men. I have an excellent illustration of the injustice of the crucifixion and the justice of God's judgment that I'd like to read to you. This is called the long silence. At the end of time, billions of people were scattered on a great plain before God's throne. Most shrank back from the brilliant light that was before them, but some groups near the front talked heatedly, not with cringing shame, but with belligerence. Can God judge us? They said to each other. One young brunette said, how can he know about suffering? And she ripped open a sleeve to reveal a tattooed number from a Nazi concentration camp. We endured terror. Beating, torture, death. Another man, a black man, lowered his collar. What about this, he demanded, showing an ugly rope burn. Lynched for no crime but being black. In another crowd, a schoolgirl with sullen eyes. Why should I suffer? For being pregnant, she said, it wasn't my fault. And far across the plain were hundreds of such groups. Each had his complaint against God for the evil and the suffering he had permitted in his world. How lucky God was to live in heaven where all was sweetness and light, where there was no weeping or fear, no hunger or hatred. What did God know of all that men had been forced to endure in this world? For God leads a pretty sheltered life, they said. So each of these groups selected a leader, chosen because he had suffered the most, a Jew, a black, a person from Hiroshima, a horribly disabled arthritic, and in the center of the plain, they consulted with each other. At last, they were ready to present their case. And it was rather clever. Before God could be qualified to be their judge, he must endure what they had endured. Their verdict was that God should be sentenced to live on the earth as a man. Let him be born a Jew. Let the legitimacy of his birth be doubted. Give him a work so difficult that even his family will think him out of his mind when he tried to do it. Let him be betrayed by his dearest friend. Let him face false charges. Let him be tried by a prejudiced jury. Let him be convicted by a cowardly judge. Let him be tortured. At last, let him see what it means to die and die terribly alone. 
Let him die in agony. Let him die so there can be no doubt that he died. And let there be a whole host of witnesses to verify it. As each leader announced the portion of his sentence, loud murmurs of approval went up from the throng of people assembled. And when the last one had finished pronouncing sentence, there was a long silence. No one uttered another word, no one moved, for suddenly all knew that Jesus had already served his sentence. Jesus knows what injustice is. And today, if you're not a child of God, he invites you to come, to receive forgiveness freely from him. And if you were to say, no, no, I don't need that. I'm good. I'm close. I'm almost a Christian. I can do this. And someday you will stand before him, the one who died in agony in our place, he will judge. There will be books that are open. Our deeds will be written down. Our thoughts, our very words will be there. And he'll judge us righteously. The good news is, none of us has to be judged by those books. There's another book. It's called The Lamb's Book of Life. And if our name is written there, then we're not judged for what, we, what, what we've done, what we've said, what we've thought. Jesus Christ already paid that penalty at the cross. And you can have that forgiveness today. Father, it's hard to comprehend that you would allow your son to be falsely accused and falsely convicted and, and thrown to the wolves, given over to Roman soldiers to be tortured and beaten and mocked, that you would allow your son to have his face covered and, and be beaten up until we couldn't even recognize him anymore. Father, that's an incredible injustice. We say thank you for doing it so that we can have forgiveness freely, so that by grace we can be saved through faith, not of ourselves, so that we can know our sins are forgiven, that you are both just because you've already judged sin, and you're a justifier of those who believe in Jesus. And I ask, Father, I beg you this morning, if there's anyone listening to my voice that is not a Christian, they don't know that their sins are forgiven, and they don't know that they have eternal life, that today would be the day of salvation for them. And for my Christian brothers and sisters, I ask that you would give us grace to not fixate on the injustice of this world, to not be distracted by all the mean-spiritedness that might happen to us, but to forgive others as Jesus, who died in our place, said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Give us freedom from that bitterness, from those grudges, from the revenge that sits in our heart like a deceitful dragon wait, waiting to destroy us. Father, bring conviction Send your Holy Spirit to guide us into our own response to you this morning. And we pray these things in Jesus' name.